Okay, hello. Um, so welcome everybody to the first online meeting of the Shakespeare Teachers Conversations. Uh, so I'm Jill Woods. I'm a senior lecturer in Renaissance Literature and Theatre at Birkbeck University of London uh, and I'm the convener of, of these seminars. Some of you, um, although by no means all of you, some of you will know that this is a semi-regular uh, series that's run at Birkbeck through our Centre for Medieval and Early Modern Worlds. And what we like to do is put teachers from all different kinds of sectors and contexts into conversation with one another. Uh, so we usually have people from schools and universities, but also uh, we've had librarians, people from theatre education programmes. And the aim really is to try and share ideas and resources and to, to talk through challenges in a fairly collaborative way. Uh, so I suppose now more than ever, that seems like a, an important thing to be doing. It's really exciting uh, today to move out of the seminar uh, into a, a kind of really global uh, gathering today. Um, sadly, that means I am not able uh, to share the kind of dodgy wine in plastic cups that I normally sort of foist <laughs> on people. Um, but I think uh, we gain, obviously, uh, this fantastic opportunity to make uh, connections that aren't normally possible in our sort of real meetings. Um, so wonderfully, we have two fantastic uh, speakers from different ends of the globe. Um, so I will, I will introduce those uh, in just a moment. Uh, but I'll just give you an overview of how this session is going to work. So we're going to hear from our speakers first and then take uh, questions and comments all together at the end. Um, just to explain a little bit how the, the tech works, um, because it, it is making things a bit more rigidly formal than we would normally have it in our, in our kind of real life um, sort of Shakespeare teachers conversations. So I'm afraid in this webinar mode, um, as attendees, you are all automatically muted, um, but you can, um, you can type in a question. So if you sort of hover your cursor at the bottom of the screen, you'll see there's a little Q and A um, icon. So you can, you can type a question there um, and we'll address them after the presentations. Or alternatively, when we get to that bit of uh, the session, you can use the um, raise, raise your hand icon. Uh, and at that point, uh, we can unmute you. So you can use your microphone and ask the question in the normal way. Um, I do think that the way these platforms sort of shape our interactions is quite interesting and might be something we could think about um, in, a, in a future session. Um, but anyway, that, that's just a kind of overview. Um, having said all of that, I should mention that I've been doing all my online teaching via something called Collaborate and I haven't yet used Zoom webinars. So who knows whether <laughs> I'll be able to manage all of this uh, effectively. If I make mistakes, you're just gonna have to see that as a really useful learning moment, right? Something that we can uh, know what to avoid in our own, uh, our own uh, sessions. But anyway, let's move on. Uh, so I'd like to introduce our first speaker today. Uh, Dr. Jenny Stevens has taught English at both undergraduate and secondary level. She currently combines part-time A-level teaching with academic writing, series editing for Methu and Drama, and consultancy work for the UK exam regulator Ofqual. Her publications include Faith and Fiction and the Historical Jesus from 2010, uh, which is a study of the mid to late Victorian novel. And she is the co-author of Essential Shakespeare 2013 and Shakespeare and Early Modern Drama, both of which are published by Arden and both of which are terrifically useful for, for students and teachers alike. So I heartily recommend them. Um, a third book uh, with Arden, Shakespeare, uh, sorry, Studying Shakespeare Adaptation, is due for publication uh, in September. So something for us to look forward to. She's going to be talking to us today about Shakespeare Unlocked Assessment Free Othello. So I'll hand over to Jenny next. Thank you very much, Jill, um, and thank you also, Jill, for making this possible. Uh, I think it's a really exciting um, new event for us. Um, first thing to say is I've got nothing in terms of wonderful classroom resources for you, which is perhaps not a great start, because in many ways um, I'm going to be talking about what I refer to as my rabbit in the headlights period of remote teaching, those first few um, days when school was um, closed. Um, and it's really just a reflection on what I've learned about remote teaching, but also what I've learned for what will I hope be soon my face to face teaching and how it's perhaps slightly altered how I might do that. Um, just to put a bit of context um, uh, with me and remote teaching. Um, 
First of all, I'm very fortunate. I have a reasonably quiet home, although I've just had to move my boomerang son of 27 years old away. Um, I'm not new to distance learning by any means. Um, I did 10 years with the Open University um, teaching a Shakespeare course. And of course, as you probably know, the OU are very much uh, world leaders in remote learning. Um, my students are from quite privileged homes. They have very good access to tech. Um, and my school has used Google Education Suite, Google Classroom for several years. And I suppose for someone in my age bracket, I'm a reasonably enthusiastic adapter, uh, adopter, sorry, of ed tech. Um, and in fact, I've been doing things like producing screencasts for students for two or three years now, but never as a kind of central part of my teaching, always as a kind of extra stretch and challenge, as we used to call it. Um, and um, tends to be for, for students who are going on to read English at university. Um, the first remote lessons I did were with a year 13 in that really difficult, awkward period when we weren't sure whether or not the exams were going to go forward at all. Um, so I had to teach as if they were going to sit the exams. And of course, it was a very difficult and turbulent time for the students, as I'm sure you all know. Um, so in the beginning, I just did asynchronous teaching. Um, I did things like collaborative documents, a bit of Google chat, but because I'm such a hopeless typist, it, I found that a real restriction. Um, and some audio and screen recordings. There were still a lot of issues around safeguarding and live teaching. So it, it tended to be rather traditional and rather staid in terms of a remote teaching um, methods. But as soon as exams were cancelled, I found myself for the first time in 40 years teaching A-level without the sort of, um, you know, uh, frameworks, topic frameworks, assessment objectives. Uh, it was really quite heady. Um, and obviously I've taught non-exam in Shakespeare when I was teaching, for example, lower down the school, but also for GCSE coursework, if we remember that, um, but never actually for uh, Shakespeare for A-level. Um, so, freed from assessment objectives, and I have to say, I have no objections to assessment objectives in general. I've actually been involved in writing the, the most recent batch, but I have felt for the last 20 years increasingly restricted by them. More and more that they're in your face, that accountability measures make them more and more um, important. And although I, I despise myself for it, as the exams get closer, I find myself saying things like, that's a really lovely comment, but you know what? It doesn't meet assessment objective five. So why are you saying it? You know, it's a bit like, you know, as a parent, you say, I will never say because I told you so. And you always do say because I told you so at some point. So lightheaded with the idea I could teach anything I liked um, within reason. My year 13 were my Shakespeare group. One of my year 13 was a Shakespeare group. So I decided I've got, almost six hours of teaching. I'm going to teach Othello all the way. Um, and the reason I chose Othello was because I talked about it an awful lot in my teaching of the other texts. So I'd done Twelfth Night with them, Duchess of Malfi, even the Merchant's Tale, I touched on Othello and the whole idea of buckholdry. So I thought, right, I will actually um, do the text. I knew they didn't know it at all because they told me that many times and I still bashed on about it as you do. You know? um, so the group also was made up of um, potential undergraduates who were going on to do quite sort of cognate subjects to literature. So drama students, film studies students, and quite a, a lot of English lit students. So I thought it would be something that they could carry forward. And I wanted to really make them feel they would be carrying things forward. They would be undergraduates because you know, it was a very, very tricky time. Um, I also knew I could be quite nimble with Othello because I, I knew it well and I needed to be nimble at that particular um, point in time. So my next decision was to take an entirely performance-led approach. Um, so we had no text apart from um, 20 lines times three, if you like, for the three sessions I did. So we started instead from a production and I chose the Hugh Guashi, um, Iqbal Khan 
um, RSC Othello. Um, we have it on Drama Online, which we are very lucky to subscribe to. And the reason I chose this was, first of all, I'd seen it, which was quite handy. Um, I also thought it was an important performance in terms of Hugh Quash's retreat from his position that he felt Othello was the one role no actor of colour should play. And then, of course, he played it because Iqbal Khan, I think, really did a lot of arm twisting. So I thought it was important in terms of performance history of Othello. Um, I'd also heard Iqbal Khan talk about the production with Helen Hackett from UCL, and he was just fascinating on it. Um, and then Sonia Masai, who of course has done one of our teacher conversations in the past, cited this production as one of her inspirations for her latest book, Shakespeare's Accents, which is a fantastic book. Um, because if you know the RSC production, it has um, a black Iago, the first I've ever seen, which is why it kind of really had a big impact on me. Um, and you have the actor, um, Lucien Masmati, and he has a Tanzanian accent. Um, and then you've got Hugh Kwashi with that cut glass public school accent. And it brings out some really interesting interracial tensions in the play. Um, and as, as Sonia herself has said, you know, it really did break interpretive ground. So I thought it was also important in that respect, as well as just in, in, in performance um, terms. I'd also been interested in um, <clears throat> the whole idea of Shakespeare and the live theatre broadcast experience. Um, and of course, a lot of work's been done on that recently by people like Pascal Ebischer. So I was interested in how students would respond to this form of digital um, spectatorship, I suppose. And although I'd used broadcasts before, Globe on screen, for example, and even um, um, Shakespeare on screen, which was the first of all with the Greenwich Theatre, um, I've never had the luxury of thinking about the medium in itself rather than just the text in front of us. So my grand plan was that they would watch the production themselves in isolation, and I just gave them three or four focus questions to think about while they were watching, very much performance centered as well. Um, so what they could see and what they could hear essentially. I didn't ask them to read the text at all. Um, and so they went away and I gave them one textual extract which we then talked about alongside our impressions um, of the production. Um, now, I would love to say that I spent a long time deciding on which three I would have, but I didn't because I, I didn't have a lot of time. So very predictably, I chose um, Iago's, you know, in, were I the more I would not be Iago, Othello's um, soliloquy, happily for I am black, and Amelia's kind of worldly wise, um, men and women in the willow scene. So it was very predictable stuff. So how did it go? Well. They all turned up, which was good. And the first thing that I noticed about uh, live teaching was that mic icon acts as a fantastic constant monitor of contribution. It made me shut up because I, that's my big fault as a teacher is I talk too much and I could say, oh no, stop, stop, get off the mic. But it also made me realize that students um, contributed more equally than they would usually, which I'm, I'm still finding quite intriguing and whether or not something to do with the interface itself but they did um, really um, contribute in a very um, generous way and um, they were more upfront about what they didn't understand because I think this was a very low stakes kind of exercise um, and so that in itself was revealing and I know they watched it with close attention not only because of their comments because some of them even watched the curtain call which brought itself a very interesting point because in the curtain call you have this lovely moment where Othello and Diago, Kwashi and Masmati, embrace really warmly and the students had great fun, especially the drama student, talking about is this, does this constitute breaking the fourth wall or not? And so I knew they had watched it, which is, is always good with remote activity, you have to be quite sure. Um, they made a lot of very natural, it seemed to be quite natural links to their set texts. So whereas usually I would have to go AO4 connections with other texts, come on, let's think about it. Because they didn't have 
the, the text itself. They relied more on the text that they did know. So I suppose some of the responses were, and the connections were quite predictable and quite character based. So, you know, Sir Andrew is a bit like Rodrigo, Iago and Bozola, um, and Cariola and Amelia. But there was one girl who had gone off for some reason and read Hamlet who made a very interesting point about how a fellow does allow Desdemona to confess. He doesn't want to kill her soul. Whereas Hamlet, you know, he's quite, he doesn't want Claudius to die in a state of grace. So there were some more subtle links that I really did surprise me. Um, they made some interesting uh, connections between the set and the actual language of the three speeches I'd set them. Because they weren't overwhelmed with text, they paid closer attention to it. So um, if you know the production at all, if you don't, I'm just going to describe that the actual stage set has this wonderful pool in the middle of it. And this pool is uh, used variously throughout the production. So for example, sometimes people are tortured and waterboarded in it. At other points, like the Willow Sea, you've got Desdemona dipping her feet in it in a very sort of laborious way. Um, but there's also a moment, you know, at the point that Iago stage manages that discussion of Cassio about Bianca, or Iago, but a fellow is listening on and he's talking about Desdemona. And there you have a fellow who is actually in the pool, and there's a kind of grid placed um, uh, over him. And one of the students noticed that it reminded her of the vapour of a dungeon, which is in one of the said speeches. And so, that connection really made them engage with the language um, in a way that I think that they don't always when it's just a page in front of them. And I was amazed by the shrewdness of some of their responses. A lot of teachers have said that's, this to me, that they, they realise they're underestimating their students when they're remote, once you start remote teaching and they're doing more stuff on their own and the classroom is more flipped, you really do get a sense that, you know, they're really quite good when you let them loose. Um, and in one of the students, actually almost verbatim, um, I, I'd ask them um, to think about their response to Othello in his final speech, you know, one who loved not wisely. And one girl more or less quoted a, a, a verbatim Eliot of the whole idea of he's just cheering himself up. I was taken aback and said, blimey, T.S. Eliot said that. She was very, very chuffed. Um, so, they also, I think, bought their individual strengths um, to play in a way they might not have done in a classroom situation face to face, where they tend to silo, this is English, we've just come from history, this is English. It was more interdisciplinary, um, I think, simply because they didn't feel quite so much locked down in one subject. Um, so, for example, my drama student really laughed when she saw the Amelia speech because she said, this is a speech we're told never to do for auditions because everybody does it. But you know what? I'm going to do it for you all. So she did us a wonderful audition speech. Um, and my film studies student was very, very quick at thinking about camera angles, which some of us, you know, just didn't really pick up on. And so there's a great moment at the end of the play where you've got Desdemona and Amelia, a fellow dead on stage, and this overhead shot suddenly, and you see the three dead. And um, this student said, well, if this was the Duchess of Malfi, you'd have to put the camera much higher in order to take in all the dead bodies, which of course brought us back actually to a more typically literary idea and, you know, AO3 literary context. So there were ways that the assessment objectives were being met, but they weren't being met in quite such a kind of great grindish way. Um, it also thought, um, released them to be more diverse in the way they argued points and responded to things. So there's a moment at the end of the play where just after Iago decided he would be entirely silent, that uh, the actor laughs. And of course, this is not in the text, as we know. Um, and students were very, very different in the way they responded to this one moment. So some thought it was kind of a less. Some thought it was deeply threatening. Some thought it was kind of pathetic. So it, they really did respond in ways that, which were very free, I felt. Um, there were also things that came up where I felt I taught or at least brought out ideas in a way that 
was more successful than when I do it in the classroom. So soliloquy is something I've always found difficult to teach because students come from GCSE with actually very naive and limited idea of soliloquy, which you don't want to kind of bash on the head. Um, but there was a moment in this production where it's in the RSC Swan, which is very intimate. And it was Iago's soliloquy, you know, who is it that says I played the villain? And he played for laughs and all of the audience laughed. And my students said how uncomfortable it made them feel. And also they felt the audience was uncomfortable and the laughter was uncomfortable. And it made them realize that sometimes soliloquies make you complicit in something which is awkward and difficult. And I, I don't think that would have come out in such a good way if I'd simply been looking at that on the page. And I suppose having a text which they didn't know at all freedom from sort of fidelity, anxiety, for want of a better word. They didn't have a text to say, oh, but that's not what it's like in our Arden Shakespeare. Um, and yeah, I mean, I always try to uh, impress on them at the very beginning of the course that the play in front of them, this big fat Arden text, is a bit like a sock in a drawer. It's not really a sock until you put your foot in it. So, you know, it's not a play until it's put on stage. And depending on the foot that is put in the sock, it will change the, what the sock looks like. Um, but I then sort of like said, right, okay, page one. Um, but it really was the sock, the full sock, um, in this respect. Um, so we free them up from, from anxiety. And there's a, lot, uh, there's a lot to be anxious about in Iqbal Khan's performance script because he changes a lot. He changes a lot about three. I think partly in response to, to Kwashi's own um, reservations about the play, actually. But a couple of my students who have learning requirements uh, did watch the subtitles and they proved to be egregiously uh, erroneous almost all the way through, sometimes very amusingly. So, for example, I kidded thee ere I killed thee was our very favourite. But there was also a really disturbing one. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a part in the production that, you know, the drunken scene, where um, Iqbal Khan puts in a sort of battle rap. And so you've got Cassio, who is rapping with Montano, who is played by an actor of colour. And so Cassio raps, it's rare to see a black man on the right side of the law. And then Montano counter raps with, we all know what happens when we give white people a gun, except the subtitle has put it back into the stereotype. Um, we all know what happens when we give black people a gun. That wasn't an arrow mishearing. It was, and so we had some great conversations around that. And uh, you know, thinking of what's happening right now in the states, whoa, is that an interesting mis subtitling? Um, so if I were to teach this again, what would I do differently? Because this was in the early days, how would I, I suppose, change my remote teaching? First of all, I would flip the classroom a whole lot more. I tended to start every session with a little bit of a spiel because the A-level teacher and me kept coming out thinking, I've got to place a fellow in the um, I would play much more to the students' individual strengths. I'd make it more student-driven. I know now how to use Google Meet so that students can go into separate groups and then drop in. And I'd also use the quick question function. Now, I know everyone's um, different technologies have different affordances, but um, uh, Google has this wonderful thing where you can set a really fast question, then you get private responses from all your students, and then you can extrapolate from them and generalize. And it's a bit like, you know, Ash's conformity theory. I always feel that sometimes you, you ask a question, a student says A, another student says B, and then most other students will say A or B. Um, but actually, if you do the quick question function, you will find, you know, A to Z um, in terms of their responses. So I would do a lot more of that. I think I'd still stick to one production. And I feel, especially for those students who are going to read English, they know now of the pace that they'll be working at, you know, because they will be doing that probably in a week or two. Um, so I think I'd stick to that. I, I know a lot of my colleagues were doing kind of just unseen extracts, but I wanted something to kind of bond them in some ways and, and that they'd remember. And so very finally, how will this inform future face-to-face -face teaching? Well, 
uh, just in, in a small way, there were certain activities that I would now call them, which didn't start out as activities. So one example, we were talking about um, the handkerchief, as you do. And I suddenly realised, because I was at home, that I had my Arden texts in front of me. So I said, well, look, here's the Honingman Arden, and it's got a handkerchief on. Isn't that interesting? And then I thought, oh, I've got four Arden texts on here. So I got the Ridley with the black face. And then I thought, oh, and there's the Arna Thompson with the sheets and the Paul Prescott performance one with the lighted candle. So three of those um, covers have a stage property on them. And I then, I don't know why, usually if I was teaching this from the page, I would say handkerchief, Thomas Reimer, look to your linen, Linda Boos, you know, seminal article. But instead I said, have you heard about something called thing theory? It's really interesting. So I got them into thing theory and, and gave them a link to uh, Bill Brown talking about the thing theory in Chicago. And they, they decided he was the coolest, I'm sorry, Liv, he's the coolest academic um, in the world. They all completely fell in love with him. So there you go. Um, so I, that is kind of just a small example of what I, and also I've put this on the resource issue. If you haven't yet tried out the Penguin Book Converter, it is genius. So Penguin have got this thing and you can make your own book cover. So rather um, late in the day, I've set my year 13 the challenge to do their own Othello book cover. Whether or not they'll do it, uh, I, I'm not sure because they've now gone off into the sort of sunlight. Um, the other major difference uh, that I think I will make is for the first three weeks of my teaching of the new lower six, which I hope will be face to face in September, or two of them, um, I'm not going to pick up my main text at all for three weeks. I'm going to do one play totally centered on production and I'm going to do Titus as I know I will talk a lot about it in the, in the course of the play. I'll possibly do Julie Tamor's film and if I do I'll then introduce into sort of film term terminology they will need when we look at say Cosin Seth or Anne Marader's Hamlet. Um, or I might do Lucy Bailey's uh, on the screen that's what I decided. But I think just in practical terms, I don't know what everybody else's schools are like, but we have so much movement in the first three weeks of the lower six. So they might be starting Hamlet with me, but then they might have to move to another group where they're doing the Tempest. So it also kind of in a practical way means that they won't be um, behind. Um, whether or not when I come on to do my exam text, I will decenter the text entirely and just start from production. I'm not sure, to be honest, because in the end, what they have to do in the uh, exam is, you know, write about the text. Um, but whichever one I, I, you know, and I'm not a performer, I'm not someone who doesn't interrogate that, that mantra of who Shakespeare wrote the stage. You know, I can, I can argue the opposite with all the vigour, if it bad, not the rigour of Lucas Earn, you know, I, I really do. Also, I'm very interested in Shakespeare on the page. But whichever I choose, I'm absolutely certain that um, it's given my teaching a new lease of life, I hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you. That was a fantastically um, rich uh, discussion. I'm so impressed with how quickly you were able to respond to that situation. So thank you so much for that. Also, the full sock is a metaphor that will stay with me um, for a long time. Um, so as I said before, we're, we're going to um, hold questions until the end. I'm sure people will have lots of things that they, they want to speak to there. Um, but I would like now to introduce you um, to our second speaker today, who is uh, the fabulous Liam Semler, who is Professor of Early Modern Literature at the University of Sydney. Uh, he is the leader of the Better Strangers Project, which is an education collaboration between the university and a Sydney school. Uh, and this is a project that runs the, the marvellous Shakespeare Reloaded website. He is author of uh, Teaching Shakespeare and Marlowe, Learning Versus the System, which again, well, I recommend all of these, uh, our speakers books, they're all fantastic. Um, but yeah, so Teaching uh, Shakespeare and Marlowe, Learning Versus the System from 2013, and co-editor of Teaching Shakespeare Beyond the Centre, Australasian Perspectives, again, 2013. And today, Liam is talking to us about the gift of education. And I just need to do a bit of technical wizardry 
hopefully to allow Liam to show some slides. So if you just bear with me um, one moment. Um, okay, hopefully that should work. <laughs> That's great. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jill. That's fantastic. And um, uh, thanks also, Jenny. It's um, yeah, just lovely to hear uh, what, what your experience was. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, the bulk of my uh, paper will... I mean, my whole paper is just talking about three pictures. So you've got the pictures, uh, but I'll, I'll spend most of the paper talking about the first picture and then I'll talk about the other two um, at the end and they're slightly more practical. Uh, the first picture, though, is kind of um, my grand theory of everything that I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of madly working on at the bottom of the world. Um, so eventually it'll, uh, it'll do something terrible to people, but hopefully in a good way. Um, so what I want to do is um, uh, go through, uh, explain uh, something about what I think is the boat that we're in um, as educators in lots of different disciplines, really, but my discipline is, is English. Uh, and uh, just talk about the way I'm seeing the context because what I'm working on is is a vocabulary that works for me as a teacher to talk about my context uh, rather than um, a vocabulary that's passed down to me from those in charge of my context. So that's really what I'm up to. And my narrative will be heading towards the end point of talking about the gift. Um, and so that's really the thing that I'm currently trying to get my head around this idea of the gift of education or the gift that the teacher brings. What might it be? How can we talk about it? And how can it lift us into more positive space um, out of the situation that perhaps we've been in for a little bit um, too long? Uh, I'll, what I'll do now is I'll share my screen because that will let me go through uh, my handout as a, as a slideshow. <clears throat> There we go. Okay, um, that should be visible, I hope, to people. And uh, so I'll get straight uh, underway. Uh, what I want to indicate here is that um, to begin, uh, there's, a, there's a world that we sit in as educators. And uh, the name that I've given to it in, in the way that I think about it uh, is cis-ed. And it's meant to be a negative term. It's also meant to be an ugly term that is kind of corporatized. Uh, and what it's really indicating is that any educator in any discipline area um, is at sea or afloat or partially afloat uh, on a educational sector that's characterized in a particular way. And so the term CISED though is meant to indicate that we're in a sector which is characterized by over systematization, that it's over systematized. Uh, so it's a negative term, it's a pejorative term. It doesn't mean that systems are bad. Uh, there are plenty of good systems. Uh, and it doesn't mean that systems in the education sector are all bad. Uh, there's lots of uh, improvements and benefits from systems, particularly when we're dealing with large numbers of students, whether it's at primary school, high school, uh, university. And everything that I say now, um, I tend to think of uh, education and the teaching of English um, across secondary and tertiary sectors. I think of the shared um, space of people who love, who love English or literary studies or related um, disciplines. Uh, but <clears throat> to go back to um, CISED, Basically, it's alluding to the fact that since the 1980s and 1990s, right through to now, there's been this push towards what, what people call the standardization era, or there are many ways of, of referring to it, some of them not very polite. Uh, and some jurisdictions feel particularly burdened by it. Um, Australia, there's a lot of talk in, in journals and, uh, and in uh, more public um, fora about the constraints of the way the educational sector is over systematized, over standardized and subject to um, pressures such as audit um, and measurement and control. Uh, and I'm thinking of the origins back here in the 1980s and 1990s when the 
educational sector was perceived to be languishing, overindulged, not professional. And so it's a government driven attempt to um, standardize and lift standards and drive what happens in classrooms. Uh, and yet it's continued on and on and on. And uh, the way I'm looking at it now, particularly from my experience in New South Wales, uh, and there's, there are lots of parallels in the, in the UK, but also, also in the United States and some other jurisdictions. Um, there's a big question about whether this so-called professionalization of the sector is helping teaching or not helping teaching. Uh, and that's a, that's a very hard fought debate. It's also redefining what it means to be professional. And that's another space in which um, there are plenty of, of arguments uh, to be had. So my main point though with uh, CISED is that there's an imposition uh, over the decades from the 80s and 90s up to now, there was an increasing imposition of various forms of audit and measurement and control uh, that determined what happens around teaching, but also what happens within the classroom. And so this sense of teachers feeling rather embattled and also um, having their agency constrained and reduced in various ways. As I've said before, um, not all systems are bad and there are benefits around to be had. But when I use the word sysed, I'm indicating that there's an over evolution and over systematization uh, that's gone on where now all the problems that we might have in teaching are felt to be able to be solved by more systems. And it's just a relentless um, uh, kind of cycle that we kind of get stuck in. <clears throat> so CISED over the last 30 or 40 years has restructured teaching and it's also restructured the teacher. And one of the biggest complaints about um, CISED, if I can use that now as a shorthand for um, a professional context in which you always feel you are being audited or surveilled, you feel you have to perform certain functions to meet um, rigid measurement and control operations. Uh, teachers are feeling, and they've, they comment often enough, that they are a middle person. They've become a middle person positioned between CISED and the student. And the quality of them as a professional is measured by how close they deliver what CISED wants delivered to the student. And what that means is that if the teacher deviates too much from the requirements of CISED and the various standardized protocols, then that is seen to undermine the teacher's professionalism. And so their professionalism and their profession uh, gets, they get defined by the closeness of their adherence to CISED's objectives. <clears throat> so that's why the CIS comes first, the ED comes second. The system is leading education. Uh, and uh, one result is that the teacher is becoming something of a middle person. Now there's evidence all around the world of the impact of um, teaching on first time teachers and just the, the strain and the pressure of entering this particular workforce. And um, there's a lot of debate around this problem of retention for new teachers and, and particularly that first five years. And the evidence is indicating that in many cases, they're not burnt out by teaching in that space. They're not burnt out by students. They're often crushed by dispiriting processes uh, and lack of acknowledgement or connection to management and onerous compliance processes. In other words, there is an over systematization and there is too much administrative churn going on. And that's not why teachers entered the profession. Many teachers, and this is, this is what makes teaching such an amazing profession, many teachers enter teaching with a deep seated love of a subject and of people. They, they actually love people and they, they want to teach, teach their students because they love them. And uh, 
what they come up against are the various constraints imposed by CSED, which can limit that. Now, what I'm talking about already is the idea of the gift, that often teachers will come into the profession driven by a very personal identification with the gift of teaching or, or, the, or the need to give or the desire to give, not just to the subject area or to the students, but in a way they, they are giving to the world. It is a profession that gives to the world. Uh, but they exit prematurely from the profession. And it's not through selfishness. It's actually often because they cannot continue to give because the system, um, and one way I look at this, is that over the decades, CISED has de-gifted education. It's made less and less room for giving within uh, the educational space because more and more room is absorbed by um, compliance process and contractual arrangements between teachers and students. There was a great memoir written in 2018 by an Australian primary teacher called Gabby Stroud uh, and that book's called Teacher and uh, that's about how um, sis ed really crushed her and she left the profession. Um, that's to put her story in my terms, but, but that's what she's describing. But Gabby Stroud had a wonderful phrase. She said, I did not leave teaching. Teaching left me. And I just thought it was, you know, it's a phrase to pause upon. Um, and again, it's something about the gift. She wanted to be there. She, she was desperately wanting to give as a teacher. Uh, and yet um, teaching was taken away from her. And, and when it was taken away, it was taken away by all the compliance processes. And she felt um, somehow split inside. And she also felt, what are they left with? They've still got me as an employee, but they've taken my teaching away from me in some way. Uh, and so she left uh, that profession. <clears throat> All right, so what I'm arguing, I guess, is over the last 30 years or so, CISED has reshaped the sector and dominates the sector, including universities and schools. Uh, and its crowning achievement is not just reshaping the sector, but also reshaping the teacher as someone whose professionalism is defined by compliance with uh, CSED's demands, the teacher becoming a middle person. <clears throat> and teachers are well used to this because in the media and also often by ministers, par parliamentary ministers, they're often narrativized as the problem. Uh, this whole narrative around teachers as a type of obstacle or a work in progress. And again, this is a narrative about professionalism where the idea is to push the teacher closer to the ideal that sis ed would understand of the teacher uh, and that's because i think um, you know a teacher which brings a very powerful individual gift to teaching uh, brings something quite explosive and and it needs forms of control uh, and particularly if you want to standardize your uh, approach to teaching now let's look at english the boat uh, so in this world of CSED, this whole sector of education, uh, the subject of English is changing. Uh, I think it's changing at school, it's also changing at university, uh, maybe in slightly different ways. But a key thing about English is that it's drifting, I believe, toward the self, where, where the encounter with English is often primarily about how the texts I encounter can be my voice, can speak for me. Um, so how I, can, how I can speak through the texts I encounter. And also drifting towards the importance of the present tense. Uh, there's a dropping away of historical literature, um, for example, at, um, at universities in Australia, for, for example, uh, but also elsewhere. So the discipline of English um, is going to persist, absolutely, but it's drifting towards emphasizing the present and it's, um, it's losing an historical reach. It's drifting towards emphasizing the self uh, and what's important for the self, not, not so much the other. Um, and that's about relevance. Um, it's a particularly, it's an understanding of what is relevant, uh, but it's an, it can be a narrow understanding of relevance. Um, and it's related to the marketplace, and particularly at university. 
um, how is English going to be useful to you as you head into the world? But there's another problem. Uh, I mean, these things are these things are perhaps facts that are just facts of change, and we need to go with them to some degree. But um, there's another fact which is really troubling, and that is the decline of reading. And um, <clears throat> I mean, children read very well through primary school, but through high school, they do seem to decline in the hours that they give to reading and the time they spend on reading. And at university, it's increasingly a struggle to get students who are majoring in English to read, um, partly because they're not used to devoting such time uh, that reading requires. And obviously, this is all related to uh, the world that we're in. Uh, and the digital revolution is a key part of it, um, unquestionably. <clears throat> And so here's the big influence that is on the horizon, uh, the storm of a transformed educational sector, transformed by uh, digital um, educational packages, artificial intelligence in education, computer-assisted um, data work in education, all manner of um, online uh, possibilities to do with education. So just as I've got that shorthand sysed, um, I'm using AI ed to refer to this trajectory of, um, of the um, influx of digital possibilities into education. And so it's, it's rocking the boat of English, but it's also um, going to rock the boat of cis ed. Uh, and now one reason for this, so there's a big question here about who's in charge, where, where will the hegemony end up? Um, CISED is largely government and regulatory authority. Um, you know, that's the way things are controlled. But with AI-ed, the prime mover is business. It's corporations, it's private, it's, it's more about profit. Uh, now, you know, any, <laughs> there obviously will be deals there between regulatory authorities and the products that the market produces, but there's also a big contest underway. Now a key thing that um, is troubling about all this um, is that while um, the digital revolution brings so many potential possibilities and all sorts of um, wonderful options to freshen up the way we do things and connect with young people, uh, there's also this problem uh, of the, <laughs> the acronym I've got on the screen there which will largely push the boat, WWTIFH. And uh, I always love it because it's so ridiculous. Um, and it was coined by um, Paolo Blickstein, who's, a, who's a, a great guy who's right, very involved in digital education, but also really aware of um, the challenges that come with it and the need for caution. And his acronym means, we will take it from here. We will take it from here. And I just think that's, that's just a very nice way of identifying risk. So the risk is um, corporations, particularly um, educational product providers, are all about solutions. And so they're approaching the educational sector with a marketing and solutions mindset. And so they're selling solutions. They're saying, you can't appeal to all those people in your classroom, you can't know what an individual among 20 where which particular weakness they have in maths. You know, you need much more data and you need various um, educational packages that can be supplied. And so the risk is ultimately that AI ed um, will be saying to the educational sector, we will take it from here. Now, from my point of view, this raises the whole question of the teacher. Uh, and if you read any of the, um, any of the kind of marketing material related to AI ed, say produced by IBM or Pearson, there is a strong rhetoric of wanting teachers involved. Okay, I'll, I might leave it at that, but there's a strong rhetoric of wanting teachers involved. But there's, you know, there's a huge difference between the government regulation and control and then the marketplace and its control over what happens uh, in the classroom and the way we teach. Now I think, I'm trying to think about what is the gift the teacher brings. And so the point I'm at in the theorizing is that I think the teacher brings two beautiful things and they are care and presumption. 
And for me, in a way, I want that to be the gift the teacher brings. Now, um, presumption, that's two, two-sided. What, what I mean by that is, I think in, in an educational scenario, we should always presume a teacher. Now, I say this partly because, of course, there's various AI-ed scenarios that don't include teachers, where there's fully artificial intelligence managing responses to student inquiry. Um, so I think in educational scenarios, given that people are human, a human teacher is something we should legitimately presume. We should presume a teacher should be part of the educational scenario. Secondly, if you're presuming a teacher is there, I think it's incumbent on you to presume that they can be presumptuous. Now, I think that's very important because what that means is that you're saying the teacher is a necessary part of education, but you're also saying they should be allowed to have a type of presumptuousness. Now, this is all related to them being an expert, that they have an expert, a type of professionalism in their field, and they need to be allowed to act presumptuously, um, and that might be uh, against any regular algorithm or against any regular um, approach at certain points. So presumption, presuming the presence of the teacher and allowing that teacher to be presumptuous, but not without care. And so care is the other half of the equation. And here I'm drawing on a, an author, Richard Hult, and uh, just thinking about pedagogical care. And so just very quickly, um, he, he defines this relationship between the teacher and the student in a really good way that um, the teacher will be caring for the student first as an individual. So the student is an individual. In other words, they've got their own history, they've got their own family, they've got a, a complete uniqueness to them. So that student is only that person, uh, that individual. So you've got to care for a student in that sense. You've also got to care for them as a person and this is a philosophical concept and all it means is that at fundamentally the student is a person like the teacher now i really think this is important because what it means is that as a person the student is absolutely equal to the teacher absolutely equal as as a person because that's it that's what the definition is um, so as an individual as a person and then finally as someone who occupies a role the student is a student and the teacher is a teacher. They, they are both roles and they both have certain responsibilities. So certain things need to be done by the student to perform the role of being a student and the student has responsibilities and privileges and so does the teacher. So for me, that's in a way the gift that the teacher is bringing. Um, and it's a tense gift. And the two halves have to work together, but you'll notice that one of them centers the student and one of them centers the teacher. And I think that's really important and it beautifully controls, each half controls the other half. But the point I wanna end on is that we can't be negative about the digital future. Oh, it's really a digital present. Um, and we need to think, um, although at the moment, I don't think CISED knows what a gift is, because CISED is about you must do this or that to fulfill this or that. CISED is about compliance. And AIED, I don't think it knows quite what a gift is yet either, because it's still selling product. In other words, any gift is a suspicious um, gift to entice you into the market of AIED. But it won't always be like that because the commons are expanding and the possibilities of um, real benefits in the digital space are expanding. And so I think the challenge will be for the teachers to hold on to really what's valuable about them, the gift that they bring, but also to somehow negotiate with the changing uh, landscape um, that's, that's coming um, towards us and, and managing that, but not saying, letting corporations just take over and we will take it from here. All right, now that's kind of the architecture of the theory that I've been working on. So for kind of a, just a change of, um, of gear, I wanted to show you two things from the Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare Reloaded website from this Shacks Redrawn um, activity that we've been running during the coronavirus lockdown. 
And so basically, every week we're putting up a quote from Shakespeare and we're asking people, kids, to draw the quote. Um, I want to talk about two because one's from a primary school kid, that's the first one, and the other one's from a high school kid. Uh, and <clears throat> I just think um, it's very interesting uh, what's going on here. So this one is a quote from Two Gentlemen of Verona, um, and basically it's the dog in Shakespeare, and it's the dog called Crab. Now what I want to confess um, is that these two drawings are actually from my kids, so this is not a scientific study, um, but it's, uh, it, it's certainly illustrative of, of something. And um, what this one showed me so clearly was that um, the boy who drew this is in year two, he's seven, and he just loved the idea that a dog could be called by another animal, by the name of another animal. So to call a dog crab was just inherently hilarious. And so if you look at the picture, he didn't even bother drawing a dog. So he's actually drawn the name of the dog, hasn't he? He's drawn the crab. Um, but then the other thing is that um, he, he just drew a crab and I said, well, how's that a picture of the quote? And so he drew a person ostensibly walking the dog. So that's what the person's doing. The person's walking the dog. And as soon as he did that, he then came up with the quote because when he heard crab my dog, um, he thought immediately of this phrase, grab my dog. And so that's the way the picture turned out. A final comment about this, um, it kind of shows that in primary school, the Shakespearean language isn't spooky at all, I don't think. It's very fun, um, it depends how you present it, but he loves the difference of the language, that it's quirky and fun and you can play games with it. Uh, and he also, um, one thing about how he drew this, he sat down to draw the crab and he couldn't figure out how to draw a crab. And he immediately said to me, look up um, how to draw a crab on YouTube. And, you know, I had no idea there were like 10 videos on how to draw a crab on YouTube. But um, at the age of seven, he knows that that's an automatic um, source that's going to give him a type of guide that will work. And we looked it up. We found the how to draw a crab, a one and a half minute video very easy, he just played it, he tapped the screen whenever he wanted it to stop, um, just effortlessly and started it again, uh, and he got the basic um, shape and then he did the rest. But it illustrated to me that um, he thought, you know, YouTube will give me exactly what I want to help me do what I'm doing, and, and YouTube did, so he was dead right. Um, so that's the first picture, it was um, fun, clever and focused on language, I think. Uh, and then the second one, this one um, still disturbs me. And so <clears throat> this is uh, from my daughter, and I'm hoping it's not a portrait of me. Um, I'm hoping it's not a portrait of her. But <laughs> the, the thing is that she doesn't know the play Othello, but she, very differently since she's in year eight, she just took the quote, went away, thought about it, produced the drawing and came back rather than sitting with me. Now, the drawing, I find, um, shocking. I think it's violent. I think it's gendered. And I think it's possibly even raced. But um, when I looked at it initially, I thought, wow, that's a picture of Othello right off. Um, <laughs> and But I'm not sure that it is necessarily. I looked at the figure and I thought, what is the girl thinking um, is jealousy? What, what is jealousy to her? What does it mean to beware? You know, where's the threat coming from? Um, is it the teeth there? Is it being behind? Is it being large? The hands are on her shoulders or on her neck or something like that. A colleague at the University of Sydney said to me that that immediately made her think, that's what it's like at that age when I was a girl, um, this colleague said, because what it showed is that problems are overwhelming. And I was just kind of stunned by that. And, and so they were saying, it's all about the size and the control and the leaning over. And it means problems are overwhelming. And I thought there are so many ways to connect with it. But just finally, look at the girl's face. She's um, clearly um, frowning or grimacing or setting her teeth. Um, in other words, is she um, suffering under someone else's jealousy or is that jealousy her own? So um, is this a representation of what's inside 
her? Is she a victim of jealousy or is that her jealousy that's being uh, expressed? So I think, it's, I think it's quite a complex picture. I think both these pictures illustrate what is suitable to, the, to their age group, things that preoccupy those particular age groups. And um, this one um, is um, some powerful emotional uh, content uh, and, and negative in its way. But the point about both of them is that with an open-ended task like Shakespeare redrawn, they get to blend their own inner world with the words of Shakespeare. And, and like a true collaborator, um, the students come up or the children come up with something uh, pretty original from, from inside them. I'll leave, I'll leave it there. I'll stop sharing my screen now and I'll, I'll hand back uh, the host role to uh, Jill. Thanks. Thank you so much, Liam. Thank you. Um, that was really terrific. Um, and what, what wonderful pictures. I, 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 crab and dog as two. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I want to say thank you so much to both of you because I think those, um, those papers really spoke to each other in really fascinating ways, actually. So I think, you know, starting off with Jenny really talking about how freed she was by getting to move away from assessment objectives and actually Liam then talking about CISED much more broadly and, and, and kind of what's happening to the profession. I think that that completely marvellous the way that they're speaking to one another there. Um, so at this point what I'd like to do is let our attendees um, say some things. So if anyone has any questions that they'd like to ask us, uh, so I can see we might already have um yeah um so i'm gonna i'm gonna read out a couple of the questions that have already popped up but just to say if anybody else has it, a question if you'd like to to kind of raise your hand so that you can use your microphone or please do just use the q a function and type in a question and i will read them out um so karen is saying that i'm nodding at everything liam is saying <laughs> um as someone now involved in teacher trainee uh, teaching trainee english teachers how can we convey the true gift they have to offer when they may have already absorbed the ideology of CISED themselves. Having recently come through that system as students, they have perhaps already accepted a certain view of uh, professionalism. Uh, and I'll add on the extra question for Jenny so she can be thinking about it. Um, also, would Jenny mind saying some more about her upcoming book on studying Shakespeare adaptation, please? Sounds great. Oh, well, um, yeah, Karen, thanks, thanks so much. That's, um, that's a great comment. I read a fascinating um, research article that was saying that um, the age of the teacher can determine what they think of compliance processes uh, and that um, the younger generations are definitely uh, more tuned into it and they're more built by these um, structures. And I can see it at university too, when, um, whenever I do something crazy in a class, um, the students are the police. The students are the ones that will say, you know, why are you going so mad? Um, why not? <laughs> you know, how does this relate um, to the outcome? So, so they're more likely to police you than actually think um, imaginatively about what might be happening. Um, so I, I think it is, um, it's characteristic of our changing times. But I think, you know, I think the um, AI um, and computer um, online influx into the world of education may end up being beneficial in, in destabilizing and, and um, kind of fracturing the hegemony that, that CISED has. But only, I think, if teachers keep a strong voice. If that, that's part of what I'm trying to say, that we need to know what the gift is that we've got. We need to um, assert the, the type of strength that we feel we have. And I think it's difficult to do because we've had 30 years of CIS-ED reducing our sense of our expertise. Um, and I think true professionalism is gonna come from, from teachers developing their own professional maturity, as it were, from the ground up amongst themselves, finding where, where they can go, what amazing places they can go, not being told that they have to be here or there. Thank you. Um, Jenny as well, did you, did you want to speak to your, your book about adaptation? Um, I, I'd actually quite like just to add to what um, <laughs> we've been talking about with Liam. I think new teachers entering the profession are in a, a very perilous position in terms of fighting the, the, the CISED because mm -hmm. 
obviously they've got promotion prospects. Um, and quite often, if you've got a huge timetable, which is quite new because you, you haven't been doing that much teaching, you will rely quite heavily on schemes of work. And I think the quality of those schemes of work will vary from department to department, as well as how kind of firmly embedded those schemes of work are in the kind of curriculum. So, you know, some heads of departments will, I'm sure, encourage people to, um, you know, slightly tweak them or even more than tweak them to, to suit your own interests and so on. But I think for a lot of new teachers, um, what, what people could do if they are teaching teachers is perhaps try and prepare them to raise their voices um, and ways that they might raise their voices in order not to be completely crushed by this system because otherwise they will be so i think there could be a sort of consciousness raising thing you know english teachers in particular have always been the awkward squad you know in a good way and i think yeah. we've ceased to be the awkward squad but not all of us because i will always be the awkward squad but there you know it's easy for me you know, I'm at an age where I'm not going to be promoted. I don't want to be promoted. But if I were just entering the profession, then you are more risk averse. And I think, you know, that that's where the problem comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. OK, so we, we have more questions. Fantastically. Um, so Sarah asks, is there a potential for a non-examined or less examined future for English? Um, so she's given given that the positives that Jenny spoke of there. Uh, and also, is there a response to the overbearing data led nature of CISED? Uh, who wants to go the first? <laughs> Shall I just say a bit about exams first, but, um, with my off-call hat on? Um, so I've worked for the regulator now for 10 years, and of course exams are not only, um, I know this has been recorded, but I don't lose my job, but anyway, um, it's also very, very regulated as well. So quite a lot of the restrictions that come into exam Shakespeare, for example, are also because of regulatory issues in order to have a kind of um, a level playing field across the different awarding organisations. And that adds an extra layer to CISED, actually, I think. Um, and so things like, you know, anthologies being not uh, being allowed to be taken into the exam, that was a regulatory decision. It wasn't a decision that actually came from the exam boards. So exam boards often get bashed for things which are actually their fault. You know, because they are constrained by the DfE, by Ofqual. Um, so, in terms of is there a hope for um, a less examined future? I think, if if there is, it's now, because exams are going to be possibly reshaped for if they go ahead in in October and November as resets if students aren't happy with their calculated grades. And I think that will perhaps give us a sense of how you might examine things not having so many hours of assessment time. Um, and I think now the government must be regretting rowing back from the coursework because actually, um, you know, GCSE not having any coursework means we've got no GCSEs. Whereas if there could have been some coursework in the bag, then we might have had a different, you know, situation at the moment. So um, I do hope that we will move to, you know, I still remember, I'm so old, I've taught 100% course at the GCSE, which was the halcyon days. I'm just going to interrupt there a moment, Jenny, just because I'm, I'm conscious that about half of our um, auditors aren't actually based in the UK. So just to, to give oh, them a bit of, no, 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 just to give people a bit of background there. So GCSEs are, are the exams everyone does at 16, uh, and then A levels, um, the the sort of pre-university exams that 18 year olds do. And there was a massive shift led by a certain Michael Gove. Uh, um, <laughs> uh oh. But the much dearly loved education secretary who, who basically decided that eg exams were the only way forward. So, so really kind of restricted the number of set texts that people could do at English and then basically shifted more or less everything into exam only rather than coursework. I'm, I'm slightly kind of oversimplifying that, but you'd say that was broadly it, Jenny, is that? Absolutely. And interesting for those of you who aren't UK based, um, Ofqual, um, led a study um, about 10 years ago now into post-16 qualifications in various jurisdictions, including um, New South Wales, actually. Um, and it was fascinating. So we looked, and, and I led the kind of English B 
bit. Mm. And um, Michael Gove actually uh, buried the findings because actually A-level came out really well. <laughs> and he wanted it to be terrible because he wanted to reform it. Um, so it was buried in the press, despite the fact that it was two years work. And, and was actually really interesting. And we looked at Hong Kong, Canada, um, New York, um, Ireland. It was, it was one of the most interesting things I think I've ever done, actually. Mm. Mm. Sorry, um, Lisa, I, I think I'd leapt in. <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, I was just, um, I'm not quite sure what, what um, question I'm responding to, but I know I just wanted to comment on some of the um, Q and A comments there. I, um, Sarah Grandage, hi, uh, lovely to <laughs> have you there. And um, I, uh, I, I'm totally fine with the recording being shared, and we'll, uh, I guess, leave that um, with uh, with Jill and Jenny how that goes. And um, I also wanted to say to Marie and Novella, um, thanks very much for what you've written. That's that's really lovely to. Um, to th a part of what I'm trying to do is actually create a vocabulary uh, because I, I think that's one thing we've lost um, because I think the language of teaching before the 1980s was more philosophical and more relational and now the language is more managerial and more to do with audit and compliance so I think we need a language that we're happy with to talk about our experiences um, mm. Right, I, I might read out um, an, another question, if that's okay. Um, so Emma Whipday uh, has said, I loved what both speakers offered as examples of playful, creative, student-centered approaches, and was struck by how visual these were, um, penguin book covers, illustrating quotations, etc. From a practical point of view, as someone who is currently designing online versions of my modules, uh, and this is Emma just being greedy, me too, Emma, I'm with you. <laughs> um, do either of the speakers have any further examples of uh, these kinds of creative activities? Well, I mean, I could jump in and say, please do have a look at the Shakespeare Reloaded website. Um, and the, the thing about the Shakespeare Reloaded website, which comes out of our collaboration between colleagues at the University of Sydney and um, the, the Sydney School, Barker College, is that um, the website has a bit of an attitude. So we don't, um, we don't actually produce curriculum um, tailored material at all and and the material and activities is quite open-ended and seeking unexpected um, outcomes so we're right into things like complexity and um, serendipity and open-ended uh, learning tasks and and also learning tasks we found that work for teacher professional development but also work in the classroom for students um, so, uh, yeah, um, also um, send me an email. I'd love to chat about more about that. Um, I, yes, in terms of creative activities, I mean, I've just put together, it's actually for Year 13 Enrichment Programme, as it's called, and um, I've got the Liberal Arts students, and I've actually got class of 14, none of whom I know at all. And so I'm trying to, I'm, I'm looking at Ira Aldridge and various um, texts about Ira Aldridge and I'm encouraging them to respond in a creative way because they've only got a two or three minutes slot. Um, and so it might be a short film, it might be um, their own um, poem about Ira Aldridge because I, I do tend to use quite a lot of creative responses as I teach A-level, especially when I'm, I'm not feeling so pressed by these other objectives. Um, but I also got, um, this was a revision exercise with my Twelfth Night group last year. There's a fantastic silent film of Twelfth Night. It's, and it's just 10, 10 minutes long. So I got the students to do an audio recording um, to put along with the actual film commenting on it as they went through and then we just had a look at our different comments what they were noticing different i mean there's a fantastic moment at the very end where viola comes on with her clothes her female clothes on which of course does not happen in the play mm -hmm. and so you know seeing which students spotted that or not so um i i could probably think of a lot more but not off the top of my head but um I, I tend to do these creative things in a, a kind of spontaneous way in class which 
they then become part of my activities. Um, but usually my best ideas are when I'm teaching, when I'm in the kind of middle of it, I think. That, that really nicely picks up from Liam's point about the importance of, of the teacher there. Um, yeah, I'm, I, there's, there's a question that, that sort of um, picks up from that. So Maria Novello was asking Jenny whether uh, you think it's better to watch the play or the film together with the students and then have the discussion or to tell the students to watch it in their own time and then reconvene for a, online for a discussion. If the former, does the session become too long or tiring? So yeah, how, how do you manage the practicalities? Well, I think if I was um, doing the sort of remote teaching of uh, the production, it works better for them to watch it on their own, actually, simply because of the practicalities. In terms of um, if I was face-to-face -face teaching, then I do tend to watch it with them. But I still think sometimes it can be quite restrictive. My very presence can sometimes restrict them. Um, I think um, I find watching things alone much better I concentrate much better and I focus better, but that's just me. I think every student's different, that's the problem. So, you know, I like to go to galleries on my own. I like to go to the cinema on my own. I'm really not a sociophobe, you know, I have a family with my husband and son. But I know some students quite like to be together when they watch something as, as a sort of communal experience. So I can't give you a really set answer for that but I did feel them watching it on their own work quite well in a remote sense because they they really brought a lot to it no, um, thanks. Can I, sorry Jill can I just um hop in there I was thinking um uh just about activities what one activity that we have had a lot of traction with on the Shakespeare Reload website uh is one called Shakespeare and Basically, that that just supplies um, videos from YouTube. So these are videos that we've kind of picked and curated, a cluster of videos that might provoke conversation about a particular play. And so you can look at, say, you can click on the Richard the Third or click on, um, you know, Macbeth, and then there'll be a cluster of videos that are kind of uh, randomly presented, and you can pick up pick those. The key point about it is. Every um, thing is a short video, so it can actually be watched in class, and it, it takes no preparation at all. Students can just watch it, um, a five-minute video on, say, um, and these are contemporary topics, so it might be on domestic violence uh, in relation to Othello, or it might be on trust in relation to Othello, um, or it might be on, in terms of Macbeth, it might be about um, the neuroscience to do with um, doing evil. And the reason these videos um, are very engaging is because what they do is they actually are very contemporary and they get people talking about a modern contemporary thing and it's a very short video and then you go back to the play from there. So you can, you can talk about the nature of evil and then go back to Macbeth or you can talk about um, you know, various other things that the videos present. And I had one school teacher come back to me and say, you know, Shakespeare was great. I actually got my students to do their own. And I hadn't really thought about that ahead of time, but basically that teacher sent his students away and said, come back to me with some five minute YouTube videos that you think um, contribute to your understanding of a particular Shakespeare play. And, um, and they included very contemporary topics um, that these students were finding parallels with the Shakespeare play. That sounds fast, fantastic. I really like it when we can steal ideas from one another. <laughs> That's, uh, those are really great. And just to mention now, in case I forget to at the end, when I, I was going to email everyone afterwards because I know Jenny's got a, a resource uh, sheet, but I'll also resend the details of your, your website there, Liam. Uh, so everyone, yeah, you will, you will get access to some of these references. Uh, we have another question. Um, so uh, Marion Wynne Davies has asked, uh, well, First of all, says many thanks for such great talks, um, but also asks, have you any advice on how to create a sense of community in the class when we can only meet virtually? Good question. <laughs> I've got one, one very quick thing is, um, if, even with up to 30 people, if you have at the beginning the, the mics on and them um, visible on Zoom, uh, that's great. I mean, because you, you get lots of um, casual conversation uh, going on. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's something. And, and uh, you know, part of it, I've been asking people, actually, what is the word for the awkward silence at the beginning of a Zoom meeting? Um, <laughs> when you're kind of waiting to start and you can see each other and hear each other. 
no one's come up with the answer to that yet, but I'm, I'm keen to know what it is. But I, I think that does help build community. Uh, Could can I leap in and ask a quick question on, on that though, Liam? Because one of the things I'm finding quite difficult is the way the technology is forcing me to do things that I wouldn't normally do in classrooms. Like for example, this technology, which I hadn't realized when I signed up to it, was going to kind of render all of our attendees invisible, right? <laughs> which isn't great. But I'm, I'm aware that I am, I end up having to tell my students to switch their mics off because there's too much background noise. And I just wonder how you're handling that kind of technical thing. Are you basically asking people to raise their hands before they speak or do you have a more fluid way of... Well, if it's a group of 30, yeah, right, the, the raise hand function is, is pretty handy. Um, yeah. Uh, but, you know, if it's, a, if it's a smaller group that can all appear on your one single screen, then mm. you can see their hands quite, quite well. Um, and... Um, but I mean, talking to my kids, um, I've got two girls who are teenagers, um, and so they've been doing school at home via Zoom or Teams or other platforms. Um, there's a lot going on that the teacher doesn't know about, and um, you know, so you know, basically they're sending individual chat to each other. They're uploading screenshots of the teacher to each other. You know, there's all this stuff going on. Um, they're on the phone. They're on the phone to other people in other groups. Um, uh, you know, there's no point fighting that sort of life that they're living. Um, yeah, it's in a way, it's a type, it's a beautiful type of thing. I mean, and you really do see how comfortable they are with the system and how we're just kind of trying to get used to it. <laughs> oh, can I just uh, chip in with that? Um, I found, and I think a lot of teachers have found just how much. In some ways we've got to know our students better in in some odd ways with remote teaching i certainly i know their, their cats a lot better um one thing i do in because i have reasonably small groups and i can see most of them i see them all on screen but we have a hat thing now so we each bring a hat i know that's a bit Bombing. but we each bring a hat and they they put their hat on when they want to say something it just kind of livens things up I mean for me the remote teaching more than anything has been pastoral it has I've really felt that the students have needed to see me um, I mean that might sound a bit but well, I think they really do need that sort of contact um, I think things will be getting better now but things I think I think really tough for, for especially the year 13 and year 11 students so um and the, the whole mic thing i i'm just very plain and say can you all t turn your mics off until and then stick your hats on when you want to say something and it seems to work they quite like it that's great i think we've got we've got one final question which is nicely future looking um so uh laura seymour is asking uh well first of all says i found both these talks very inspiring thank you uh so much um, but Jenny uh, she says Jenny I was really fascinated by what you said about how students gave more diverse answers to your questions when you use the private chat function online um, and so this is a question for both of you I was wondering how we might encourage this type of diversity and discussion in face-to-face -face teaching should we ever get back to that I suppose <laughs> mm. I mean I, I try all the time to to do that in face-to-face -face teaching. W one thing I've always been unsure of, um, and I've never made my mind up about how far we should intervene with students who are very quiet. Um, uh, the sort of practical things I do, if I know a student's very quiet, I quite often sit by that student because I'm never somebody who will sit in a particular place. I tend to wander a lot in the classroom. But I find if I sit closer to a student, they are much more likely to say something to me because they don't have to project it across the whole room. Um, and also I sometimes just pick up on people's facial expressions and say you look as if you're a bit confused there or you look as if you don't quite disagree and that will sometimes work um, or sometimes just be much more upfront about um, we want to have very diverse, diverse views here there is no I mean I know we all say it as teachers but really remembering to reinforce there is no one right answer there might be a few wrong ones but there will be lots and lots of of possibilities and that's very much at the heart of our subject and so making it into a kind of subject disciplinary thing you know this is what our disciplinary is about it's about diversity and having lots of different views um, I think just reinforcing that and remembering to reinforce that can sometimes 
um, free them up. And the other thing I think is really important, and this is why I hope my memory stays good for another few years, is remembering what students have said and then bringing it back in and naming that student and say, remember when Blah said this, that was really interesting, but you said that. So just keeping them as kind of important voices and, and on, on a par with your own voice, I think, can sometimes be helpful. I, I noticed um, that you can have, uh, sorry, I've started halfway through my thought. Um, in, in tutorial classes at, at university, of course, there are some students who don't say anything or they're very quiet. And, and I, I've definitely found that um, breaking into small groups during the tutorial does help them, um, you know, articulate, speak and share their idea if it's just with three or so other people in a small group within the tutorial when they might never speak um, to the whole tutorial group of, of 20 something. Uh, and Zoom does offer the possibility of breakout rooms of some sort. I haven't explored that, but you know, that potentially that could be an interesting way because you can assign students into these or you can assign the attendees into these smaller breakout rooms where they'll just see a few faces and they can talk about a particular problem and then come back in the group. So, um, yeah, I guess we're all learning this on the, on the fly, I think. Um, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Okay, well, fantastic. Thank you both so much uh, for really terrific, uh, inspiring. Uh, we've, I've seen in the comments quite a few people are saying thank you and how inspirational it's been. And I, so I'd like to sort of echo and amplify that thought. Um, what I think has been really great is you, you've really dealt with some of the, the troubling challenges that we're facing right now in this moment, but also kind of more broadly. But I think really giving us a sense that there are so many positive things we can do uh, to rise to those challenges. Uh, so that's fantastic. Thank you both very much. Thank you as well to all the attendees. Thank you for the fantastic um, questions. And hopefully uh, we'll, we'll have another one of these if people are interested in doing so. Uh, like I say, I will send you all an email uh, with, with some extra resources. Um, but for now, I will stop the recording and say goodbye to you all. So thank you very much. Thank you.